All right, all right. Well, good afternoon or morning. We're almost to the afternoon, Mark. Um, this is our time of prayer that we're going to be starting soon. We still got some people kind of trickling on in. Um, and so uh, particularly on those that are on Zoom. So what we'll do is um, I want to read a scripture as we are still in our sila, um, the 60 days of sila, uh, summoning and seeking the Lord for his guidance. And so I think it's good for us to, to start off in the word. Um, and then after that, we will begin our time in prayer. And then I'll have, um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit we'll, the way that we'll do the prayer to, today. But let me open up by reading uh, some scripture. Uh, this comes from Psalm 48, <clears throat> and it says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within his citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic, they took flight. Trembling took hold of them, their anguish of a woman in labor. But the east wind you shall... The, but the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. And so just wanted to start off in, in, uh, in the word, specifically through Psalm 48, as we begin our time in prayer. Today, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to be really... Uh, the idea is recalling the t relationship between the pastor and people for 47 plus years. And so what I like for you to do is, and I'm going to leave this open to, we only have a little bit of people here. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully uh, we have a uh, uh, good participation here. Um, but because we are recalling the relationship between pastor and people, 47 plus years, I would like for you to share a time that your relationship with Pastor Stewart has been, uh, you know, it could be a sermon that he preached. It could be him, um, you know, um, visiting you in the hospital or whatever it may be, something of the 47 plus years that you can think of that is an encouraging thing for for you. And then sharing that, then after you share that, praying a prayer of thanksgiving specifically for that. For, for, for that. That's what we're going to do in this time because this whole time for this prayer, at least for these moments that we have before we start our Bible study, is going to be the time of us beginning with recalling the relationship so sharing something of, of of importance something that encouraged you that pastor stewart has done and then saying a prayer of thanksgiving that's where we're going to begin our time with today so i'm going to start and then as you feel led you could just jump in and and and, and pray and then at the end of it i will close our time all right does that make sense Father God, we want to come before you today thanking you for this time that we have to pray because it is indeed is a privilege to be able to pray to you. And as we think about, as we recall um, the relationship that we have with Pastor Stewart over this time, we just want to say thank you for all the ways that you have been able to use him mightily through different sermons, through different teachings um, that he has been able to, to do over over this over this time um <clears throat> particularly i remember a sermon that really impacted me and encouraged me it was a sermon that i've heard him preach and it was the idea of <clears throat> what is the church's reputation and he preached that earlier this year um that really encouraged me in a mighty way as i began to think about um the reputation that the church at large has. And for some people, it's not a good reputation, you know, um, not FIBC in particular, but just saying just the church at large. 
uh, but then just the um, motivation and inspiration for us to be able to think about owning the things that we can do and controlling our controllables so so that we can have a good reputation in the world. And I remember that sermon that he preached. And to this day, it's stuck with me. It's been something that I've been able to kind of go back and listen to. And just the idea of what Proverbs talks about, the idea that our reputation is better than silver and gold. And having that being able to be a catalyst for how I think, things that I say, things that I don't say, whether that may be on social media, maybe it may not be, but just thinking about our repu reputation. And so praise God for that word that he preached. Praise God for the way that it still encourages and encourages me, but I'm sure it also encourages other people as well. So as we summon and recall his pastor and people relationship, uh, I want to say thank you, God. And I pray for this to con continue in many ways. And uh, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll recall a sermon that Pastor Stewart preached, and it was on, I believe, who can find a virtuous woman. And he was talking about Vesta. And he was talking about Vesta was a, a, a woman of, I believe status, she was a woman of standing and she was also a woman of stigma. And so uh, he said that being a best eye woman uh, uh, made um, anger those that was close to her. It may make you, uh, you a talk of the town and that's negative talk. And but being a woman of stamina, uh, he said, be strong when you lose your status, but standing up for yourself, because sooner or later, the world will know that you made the right decision. And so this was one of the sermons. I All of his sermons, I, I feast on each and every Sunday throughout the week, because all of them have been a blessing to me. And, and uh, so... But that, that's one of the ones that I can recall that uh, he talked about uh, best time. And mm. so um, we, uh, we thank God for uh, our pastor, Pastor Stewart. I haven't known him for a long length of time, Lord, but uh, the time that I have known him, it's been quite a blessing to me. And I thank God for him. I, I prayed when I came to, to uh, Phoenix, that I would find a church, a pastor, a people that uh, I could grow at, that I could grow, that my son could grow, that he would enjoy, because that was actually one of my main uh, focus was that he would enjoy. And each and every Sunday that he comes, he tells me when he get in the car, I, that was a good service. I, I like that. And so I thank God for that, that he led me to a place uh, that I could grow and that uh, I would enjoy. And Pastor Stewart has been a servant. And God, we thank you for the uh, the, the servant uh, hood that is in him to be a good servant. I can only imagine uh, in my mind what God he has gone through down through the years. That's 47 years. That's a long time. That's as long as some people have lived. It's 47 years. And he has uh, dealt with your people that you know I, I'm one of your people and so he has dealt with people that I know that have agreed with them didn't agree with them yet he kept on loving them and I can only mm -hmm. imagine that that, that he must have at some point felt uh, like Jeremiah that I, I I'm going home and I'm not coming back and and you know I, I've just had it all you know it didn't go the way I I, I thought it would go and, I, and I'm just not going to go uh, anymore and, and, and preach and, and teach and warn the people of the coming of, of Jesus Christ, the coming of you. And that, uh, that we have to, if we haven't already, get our life together. And so I can imagine that he may have said that many a time, that I'm not going back out. But I'm sure that there's that fire in him that, that was, as Jeremiah said, that shut up in my bones that I, I can't, I'm gonna have to go back. And so he has gone back and he has come back and, and each Sunday and teach and preach your word. And so God, we thank you for that. 
I thank you, God, that he is, is such an approachable person. I've, I've, I've been at different churches. I lived in New Jersey. I lived in, in, in uh, Arkansas. And some ministers are not approachable. You can't really go up to them and say hi or anything like that. But Pastor Stewart is so approachable. And God, we thank you for that, that he uh, is a people person. He appears to love people. And therefore, he, he doesn't make a difference in others. And so we thank you for that. We thank you, God, that he is the, is the uh, uh, watchman for our soul. He is. The scripture says in Hebrew, he is the, the watchman for our soul. And so thank you, God, that he has been a great watchman, that he has been on the wall and that he has been watching over the people that you have placed him over. And so, God, we thank you for that. We thank you, God, that that he tells us the, the, the true word of God, that he doesn't water it down, that he doesn't uh, uh, give us something that's going to tickle our ear or uh, something that is going to make us feel good. But he tells us the word of God because he knows that he is held accountable for what he does. And so we thank you, God. We thank you for his dedication, God, that de great dedication that he gives to First Institution. And God, we, we pray that whatever is in the next chapter of his life, whatever is in the next season of his life, that you bless, that you bless abundantly. Because I know that he's not just going to sit down, that he's going to still be working in your kingdom. And so, God, we uh, uh, ask that you bless whatever he does, whatever his hand that he finds his hand doing, that you will bless it, that you will bless him going in, that you will bless him coming out that he will lack for nothing, that his family will lack for nothing. And that God, uh, we asking you to, to bless uh, 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 Pastor Karen, God, who has been by his side and, and, and supporting him and his entire family, God. And God, we just thank you. I thank you, God, that he was caring enough that when my house was totally taken down to the foundation, nothing is left there but a slab. And he called me and he wanted to make sure that I was okay. He didn't know me that well. I hadn't been here that long, but he, he saw that. He saw that need, God, and you, you, you give him discerning spirits. And I thank you for that, that he called and said, I'm, we're going to send money to the church that you used to go to, but I want to make sure that you're okay first. And so I thank God for that. I thank God that, that he uh, was loving enough that he could care enough for his members that he would call. And so thank you, Jesus. We thank you for always, for all the messages that he has given to you that, and all the things that he has poured into us, God. And we thank you. And God, we love you always. We thank you. And we praise you and we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Pastor Stewart and Pastor Kelly, this is Beverly. I just wanted to... Thank you, Pastor Stewart. Um, you may not remember, but one of my brothers got killed. He was like about 20 years old. And I remember you had just came to the church. And I asked you, would you utilize him? You didn't know me. You didn't know my family. But you agreed. And I don't even know if you remember this. But anyway, I praise God for your compassionate, your love. You didn't know me that well, but you came and you utilized my brother. And I just praise God for you. And I knew right then that you were a man of God. And um, also, I remember um, a sermon you preached about my tailor-made suit. And I remember you had just got that suit and you were so elated. And I just want to thank God right now for all the blessings that you have restored upon me through your sermon and and just been the person who you are. Father God, I just thank you for our pastor. I thank you for Pastor Stewart for being so loving, so kind, so generous, and so, so caring, Lord God. Thank you for pouring your Holy Spirit in him to just help everyone, Lord God, that he didn't even give a thought. He just does what you have ordained him to do, Father God. We just thank you for everything he's done. We thank you for all the classes that he has taught. We thank you 
that he wanted all of us in First Constitutional Baptist Church, anyone else, to learn and to know how to walk accordingly to the Word of God by giving us classes, by giving us the Word, by letting us know we need to be obedient to Him and only Him. And Father, we thank you that He has served you untirelessly, Lord God. And we just praise you that we know Him. And we thank you for his wife, Karen, Lord God, Dr. Karen Stewart. We just praise you for the talent that both of them, you have important in both to share the word. They don't only talk the word, they live the word. And I just want to thank you both for all you've done for me and for others as well. In your son, Jesus' name we praise you. Amen. Amen. For those that are tuning in and coming in, uh, we're doing the part of summoning, recalling the pastor and people relationship over the past 47 plus years. And we're sharing a moment or a time where pastors, where we're recalling uh, a good memory of Pastor Stewart. And like I said, I gave some examples. If it was a sermon he preached or him visiting you in the hospital, him encouraging you in any type of way, whatever recalling that you would like to share, and then sharing that and then also saying a prayer of thanksgiving. So that's what we're doing for those that are coming in. Um, and for those that are in the chapel, there's a microphone that you can get uh, right there. And then you can start. Uh, to pray if you want to do that and obviously those are on zoom again it's free flowing so just do it as you feel led and then i will close us in the next 12 minutes or so well the memory of uh, pastor uh, i don't know i i haven't known him for 47 years but 13 years that i've been here and every time he knew that i was in the hospital he was always there and yeah. he's know my name he, he's get to know his his um members. He remind me of my old pastor from Chicago. He's no longer here, but he was like that. Wherever you, he go with you, wherever you need, he was there for you. And Pastor Stewart reminded me so much. I'm going to miss you. Well, you know, you go where God sent you. And Father, thank you for sending me to a church that's uh, care and learning your word and teaching your word. I pray. Amen. Um, acknowledge you and thank you for allowing me to, to make my way to the chapel today and to share in this these minutes of prayer and these minutes of recollection and these minutes of thanksgiving for, for our pastor. Um, God, thank you for waking me up this morning. Um, if you know my heart. It feels heavy today. Lord, uh, um, um, just a lot of death and violence, and I, I just can't shake it, God. And so I've come to you multiple times today uh, as you're the source of peace and strength. And I appreciate you laying in my spirit your unchanging nature, Father God, um, your s uh, faithfulness. Your solid, your solidness, your continuous encouragement uh, that you're a God that does not change, Father God. That as we go through change, a big change here in this church, as we go through change almost daily, individually in our lives, that you're always there. That if we hold on to you, if our anchor holds fast to you, that is the rock. Um, we are encouraged in a deep place that that we too will make it because you have love for us and you want the best for us and father god as as i reflect on your nature i want to thank you for pastor stewart uh he has been a solid encouraging healing uh building presence in my life personally, but in congregationally, Father God. you, uh, we, I can't thank you enough for a, a pastor who does care for his sheep, who does uh, know them and uh, 
wants and prays and works for the best for each of them, Father God. And that is a direct reflection of, of your son, Jesus, Father God. I thank you for when I was in the wilderness and uh, uh, acting foolish and uh, uh, not acknowledging you as uh, acknowledging you at all, Father God. When you allowed the scales to fall from my eyes and and I looked for connection to you, uh, Father God, that you you allowed me to find my way to here to a church. And as I got familiar uh, with your word and with you, Father God, praise God for you and your spirit. And I learned about Jesus uh, through through uh, that spirit and through the the sermons and the teachings and the Sunday school and the classes. And, and I, I began to become, feel more familiar with Jesus to where now I consider him friend, guide, uh, source of hope, Father God. I thank you for the reflection of Jesus. I have always been allowed to see in, in Pastor Stewart uh, a man who continued, uh, continues, uh, has always, as far as I've known, uh, sought your will in all that he does and all that he does for us. Um, if there is a man who who I know who strives to do what Jesus did, to act as Jesus has, to um, shine a light on Jesus in a world that so desperately needs him, that man has been Pastor Stewart. And I thank you for the blessing, for not only for myself, but for so much of my family, uh, and for us as, as a church family, to have been blessed with uh, his presence and, and such a wonderful reflection of your nature, God, uh, here in our midst. Um, Thank you, God. I love you, and I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you for Pastor Stewart, God. Uh, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My memory of Pastor Stewart is when I had back surgery and had complications with my back surgery. And he showed up at the hospital after my second surgery, right before I was going to have a third one. And I was just grateful to see his smiling face and encouragement because I was starting to get a little weary. So, Lord, I thank you for a pastor who has a pastor's heart, who truly cares for his people and tries to uplift them and do what's best for them. Lord, I pray that you will bless him and his life as he goes forward. And for all the years that he has served you faithfully, that you will continue to surround him and his family with your loving arms. Lord, we thank you for him. And Lord, I am mindful there is no such thing as retirement for a minister. So he may be retiring from this position, Lord, but I know you yet have stuff for him to do. So Lord... Allow him to rest, allow him to become strong, and then put him back in the work. Amen. I want to uh, give a testimony about Doc. Uh, this is Rod. Ever since I've known him, he's always been a teacher, whether he's intentionally trying to do it or not. He's always had some type of story or example when he's talking or, or he's uh, talking about mentors and um, people that I've never heard of before because where I grew up at and the environment I came from, a lot of stuff I wasn't familiar with. And so his mentors and heroes and black preachers and historians and people internationally that love Jesus and his connections and him talking about the fact that um, the importance of the church and the body of Christ as a whole and the state of the church. Um, to me, to be honest, he's like a, a walking encyclopedia of information. And um, I really uh, appreciate the fact of his wisdom 
And sometimes when he speaks, it's just like, oh, my gosh, let me sit down and try to understand everything he just said. And he doesn't mean that in a negative sense, but he's been through so much and seen so much that um, to the average person, if you catch them on the street, if you tell them certain things, it's just like, who? But you, um, thanks, Doc, for just being who you are in Jesus. Uh, thank you for caring about studying uh, the word of God and being able to break it down day in, day out. Um, and, um, thank you for your upliftment. Thank you for just, just, like I said, just being yourself, uh, and just showing how God can use you and you could just be a regular person and God could use you. And, um, whether they become preachers or not, God can still use you. So with that being said, uh, God, uh, thank you. Lord God, for Dr. Stewart, um, as a lot of us have said already, um, whatever you have in store for him, um, just continue to guide him and uplift him and allow him to be able to touch the lives of people um, wherever he may be. Um, but then also, Lord God, I ask that you would um, take care of his body. Lord God, uh, I ask that you would restore him uh, mentally, uh, restore his soul, restore his, refresh his spirit. Lord God, uh, we know, Heavenly Father, that nothing's impossible for you, Lord God. So I ask that you would care for him, uh, care for his wife, uh, his children, his children's children and his children's children's children. Uh, be with all of them, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that the gospel will continue to go forth, Lord God, uh, through them, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that the people that come in their paths, Lord God, uh, would be blessed and they would see you, Lord God, through them, Lord God, and ask them and ask how can they be saved, Lord God. Um, and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. And as we pray, amen. Amen. All right. I have one. I have one. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Sister Diaz. Um, when we were in COVID, you know, there were so many churches that had shut down. And pastor opened back the church. And I remember going every Sunday and there was just a little bit of us. And but he knew pe his people wanted to be in church. So he safely managed. The staff was wonderful where we could go to church um, and be in person when other people weren't in person. He set that example of how safely to allow people to return to church. And then when the time was, it was it wasn't a time for where we had to stop going to church. He was. He took that discernment from God, you know, to say, hey, we need to we need to for right now, we're going to close the church back down and, and just allow the praise team so that the people could be so that we could be safe. And, and I thank God for that, Pastor. You know, God, I'm thankful for the, for you not only putting a servant's heart, but you knowing the heart of his people, Lord, that you would have put the right discernment, the right measures so that we were able to come back to church during a time when other doors were shut. You allowed him to, to serve in a manner that we were, that we were fed. You, you protected us and you kept us. And so Lord, I thank you for the discernment. I thank you for pastor's heart and, and allowing us to come back into church when other churches weren't, weren't able to. And all of these things I thank and pray in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Father, thank you for all these prayers we lift up to you as we continue on with our sila summoning and seeking the Lord for, for guidance. As we begin our Bible study time, continue on with leadership transitions in the Bible. Today, dealing with Abraham, we ask that you bless this time. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Talley. Thank you, those who offered prayers and comments. Uh, it was very, very moving. 
and very encouraging, and I certainly appreciate that. So much, so much, so much. All right, we're, 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 we're not our lesson number three, and we're dealing with Abraham, Abraham's leadership transition in the Bible. So I have a couple of initial questions. Uh, how do you think studying Abraham as a leader in transition will be helpful to us? Just initial question. How do you think studying um Abraham will be initial and helpful to us. Anyone online? Anybody in the chat? Um, this is Beverly. Um, what I believe will help is that Abraham um, he was a man after God's own heart. And what I noticed in reading um, that he followed what God wanted him to do. And he he had a built an altar um, to the Lord and he was thankful. And whatever he did, he looked to God and stayed focused on God, what God would have him do, just as we are doing today focuses on Selah and what God would have us do. We're following by listening and being still, knowing that he is God, that he will direct us in whatever situation. Okay. All right. All right. Anyone else on, on how do you think studying Abraham? And, and by the way, if you're in here, did you get lessons? I have a copy of the lesson, and, and the lesson was sent online this morning. Tracy, again, was very faithful this morning. You should have gotten it online, uh, those who that. Anyone else? I on, think that um, yes, studying Abraham teaches us to believe that something can happen even when we can't see any evidence of <laughs> it's going to happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Microphone over here. The, um, the fact that he was, go ahead. The fact that he was uh, uh, willing to sacrifice, he was willing to to uh, even uh, went to to rescue his nephew Lot from from this. Uh, I think it was a group of kings, and and he uh, also he he pleaded with God to uh, spare Sodom and Gomorrah, and so and also. You know, he he was willing to um, um, he was very faithful. He, he was faithful. He he uh, followed God's whatever uh, God told him to do. He was faithful in doing it in trusting God. And um, he was just a, a, a man of integrity. He was always willing to uh, to uh, I want to say maybe refocus on God and his plan. And so. Um, I think that that is a good um, uh, sign of a good leader. Okay. All right. Well, I would say um, amen to what's been said and add that um, when God spoke to Abraham and said, go, don't know where. Don't know how, don't know when. And uh, and as I remember, the first place he sent Abraham was in the desert, or yep. to the desert. And lo and behold, in 1970, wherever, God told this man, go to the desert. <laughs> in spite of people saying, say what? What in the world this city boy going to do in the desert? Um, and personally, I remember that there was another Abraham in my life. <laughs> Same thing about that age, i.e. my father told him to go start some church. And, um, and I think this would be helpful in the transition. 
that it was always about you wanting to do something that probably didn't make sense to anybody else. And Abraham is faithful. God said it. I believe it. Therefore, I'm going to do it. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next question. Dr. Stewart. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Just Bernie. One thing I, one thing I think we all should remember about uh, Abraham is, good and godly a man as he was, he too has his weaknesses. Remember when he lied about his wife being his sister? We're gonna get into but that. He was still, <laughs> but he was still a man, a man that followed God's will. So that we have to remember that whoever our leaders are, they are still human with their own weaknesses. That they're doing the best they can to follow God's will. Very much so. Thank you, Mr. Bird. And, and and you really answered the second initial question. Can you recall in any way? I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You don't be sorry. I mean, you just anticipated it. It uh, the second question was, can you recall in any way Abraham failed as a leader of God's people? And it was the whole thing about his wife. And and we're going to get into that today because that's in chapter twelve. So, uh, is there any any? Can you think of anything else other than when the the, the deal about his wife? And if you don't know about that, we'll, we're going to get into it today. But is there any other way? that you yes. can recall that he failed as a leader. Rod, is that you? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so you could look at the fact that um, when he had um, the other child outside of the promise, because the promise was supposed to be um, That's right. That's right. Um, I, Isaac, but he, um, That's well, right. his, his wife said, take my hand, maiden. That's right. That's and, right. and then here come Ishmael. And but God still made Ishmael a very powerful, um, well, descendants from Ishmael, very powerful nation, which we have with us today. Sure. Thank you, brother. Okay, I want somebody to read verses uh, one through four in chapter 12. And just let us know the version of the Bible you're reading it from. Out of the, out of the uh, uh, NIV. Okay. The Lord. Yes. Okay. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you unto a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and, I will be a, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be pleased through you. How far did you want me to read? Four. Four, I, I think that's fine. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, the four. Four, yes. Verse four. Verse four. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haram. He took, that's, that's four. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So I want to give a little background of that. Thank you, Sister Birdie, for reading that. Abram was a, and, and at this time, his name was not Abraham. It was Abram. Abram was a descendant of Shem, one of Noah's three sons. Uh, last week we dealt with Noah. Uh, several hundred years removed. So, so they weren't first cousins. They, they were hundreds cousins. But, but anyway, uh, he, he was a descendant of Shem. His name meant exalted father in Old Testament Hebrew. His name was later changed to Abraham by the Lord because the Lord made a covenant with him that he would become the father of a multitude of nations as recorded in Genesis 17. He and his family live in Ur, which is in modern day Iraq. So we all know about Iraq from the, from the Iraq war. Abram's family traveled hundreds of miles from Haran, which was, it, which was in what is now Turkey. It was in Haran, that the Lord commanded Abram to travel in faith from Haran to a land that he would show him. Abram and his family were to leave familiar territory and familiar folk to journey to an unknown place. The Lord promised to make Abram into a great nation whom he would bless exponentially. A scholar wrote that these promises do not just point to the future, but they explain the present realities of those who hear God's promises. 
The IVB Bible background commentary on the Old Testament offers, when Abram gave up his place in his father's household, he forfeited his security. I want to read that again. When Abram gave up his place in his father's household, he forfeited his security. Nevertheless, Abram went as the Lord commanded him, accompanied by his family. Footnote, and, and, and Sister Bertie just read it. Verse 4 indicates that Abram was 75 years of old when he left Haran. So uh, the, some questions I want to raise here out of this Bible study for us. What do you think was going through Abram's mind when the Lord told him to leave his familiar transplanted homeland in Haran to travel to an unknown country. Try to put yourself in his mind. What do you think was going? They had already traveled hundreds of miles to Haran, and then his father, Terah, had died, T-E-R-A-H. And then God says, I want you to go to a place where you've never been before. What, what, what was going through the brother's mind? <laughs> Robert, I see you shaking your head. You got you got it. Give that mic to Robert Harmon. <laughs> it would have been a fearful experience, and I would about upon two or three times said, "Lord, I'm just trying to clarify. Are you sure you want me to do this? Or is this someone else talking to me?" And um, it would, <laughs> I would have been a little bit hesitant, but uh, hopefully, thankfully, eventually, the Lord would have gotten to me. All right. Someone else. Anybody online? What do you think was going through Abram's mind when the Lord told him, get up and get out of here? Nobody else? No one else? Oh. Pastor Stewart, this is Sister Pittman. All right, Sister Pittman, and, and y'all voting in Georgia. I hope the news, y'all voting like crazy. Keep voting in Georgia. <laughs> I sent that in the mail last Friday. All right. <laughs> I voted already. All right. All right. Record breaking <laughs> vote in Georgia. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So I just think that um, I would be kind of fearful about who would the people be? Would they accept me being in their country or, you know? Yeah. Who is this stranger coming in here? That's so right. Like how I felt coming from Arizona into Georgia. You know, how would these people accept me coming from the desert into their wet land? And, uh, I even thought, how am I going to make it in this wet land? And I'm so used to the desert. Uh, you know, that was kind of contrary to my yeah. CFPD because the desert had me feeling better than out here and I, I'm telling you, it took me a couple of years to try to get together as far as the weather here. So I I, I feel like that. So some insecurity on his part. How how would he be received? He'd be received at all. Yeah. Okay, good, good. We got a couple of people here on the chat. Sister Carmelita says Abraham trusted God's lead and followed him. We also should trust God, knowing God will not leave us or forsake us. Uh, Reverend Graves says, I think he went without hesitation. Oh, by now he'd already had the ultimate test of faith. A little move probably didn't phase him. Um, and then Sister Easter said, a mixture of fear, uncertainty, and a, and a question of like, why me? Why me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Identify, and you have to have your Bibles open or your phones open. Identify the four promises that God gave to Abraham in verses two and three. There are four promises, um, and I want to see if you can see those four promises in there. If you if you identified one or more, just uh, let us know. There are four promises in, in verses two and three. Uh. Do you want me to go past this? Yes, ma'am. Okay, this is this is Nancy. Okay. He said, I will make you a great nation. Okay. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. 
Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, so the way I would identify him, and, and you put, could possibly be five, but the way he would, he he said, I, "I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to uh, make your name great." He said, "I'm going to make a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make so you will be a blessing to others, and then I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who bless you." I will curse you. Okay. I'll curse you. So, so those were the four blessings that I see in verses two and three. Thank you, Nancy, for identifying oh. those uh, uh, there. I preached from Genesis 12, one through five, over 47 years ago when I left Cornerstone Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York, to come to FIBC to pastor. This is my last message at Cornerstone. My message was titled, A Command, a Promise, and a Blessing. The Lord has fulfilled that prophetic message repeatedly. How might what the Lord has done for us over these 47 years guide FIBC during our current senior pastoral leadership transition? Let me uh, transition. Let me ask that again. How might what the Lord has done for us? So looking back, and I said he fulfilled that for me when I came here 47 years ago, how might what he's done already guide us during our current senior pastoral leadership transition? All right, Sister Deacon Womack. Well, God has made your name great. <laughs> But how is that going to help? How is that, that going to help? In the transition. Because, because um, we trust in you. We trust okay. that God's speaking to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I wouldn't, uh, okay. I don't think any of us would, would follow you if we didn't trust your word. And God has proven that he is with you. Okay. So, okay. That's, that's very, I never even expected that. That, that came out of nowhere for me so so you're saying the fact that you trust in me that you trust me as the shepherd pastor and, and that i am and that god is using me to guide us through this so your trust in me helps us in this transition okay 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 i, I, I never really never, that, that you know what i wasn't i wasn't gonna go here but that sounds about right this woman because i was gonna say is you know, as we spend time in the Bible, especially that Old Testament, so often it's just time and time again, they'll kind of recount their history and recount yeah. what God has sure. done for them and recount uh, how he showed up and, and delivered. And uh, but I see where you went. So uh, Pastor Stewart is our pastor, us as sheep of the congregation following his lead. Uh, we have that shared history of this church going through so many transitions previously that he has helped kind of guide and lead and put things in place to help us uh, as God would lead him to successfully move through all of those tr transitions. And so, and so I find that really encouraging. I mean, it's, it's a big one. But it's, you know what, well, it's another transition. Right? Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can get there. Pastor Stewart? Yes, ma'am. I want to say you have been the pastor here. You have been the leader. You have shown us what God is all about for us in our lives. So it's like a parent raising a child. If the parent has done a good job and the child has been listening, following, you can go out into the world on your own and exemplify the things that the, your parent has taught you. So we know that God is our father. We know that the church belongs to God and we are his children. We know how we're supposed to act and react in the world. So the years you spent with us, the years we've spent with you and learning more about what God is all about, we should be prepared to act like mature Christians when you leave. Moses had prepared his people. Joshua stepped up. We should 
be ready to receive whoever God sends to us and treat them with the same respect we've treated you, knowing that this is God's church and the continuation of God's work through us. Okay. Mine was short and sweet. Um, another part of Abraham's story is having a ram in the book. <laughs> so that even when we may not think things are going the way we want them to go, God's got a plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we also have um, somebody here in the chat. Um, it says iPhone because their name is not. Uh, That's so we have an iPhone. We we have a strong legacy. We are still standing, Pastor. You are well known for your ministry, all locally, nationally, and globally. We reap the benefits. Okay. All right. He has the microphone. Oh, also, you have set a good example with the trials and tribulations that you have gone through since you've been here. You you have set an example how to go through those without being ugly. <laughs> without you know i just i just respect you for that because uh, when you were going through some of yeah. these trials and all you 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 were a good example on how to act uh you you react you you didn't react you responded to what was going on in your life uh you set examples for being a good father you set example for being a good husband you set an example for being for being a good pastor you i just i just really respect you for all those things that you went through and you come out you come out good and i thank god for that all right okay oh, wait we, we, we need to give the mic because the folks can need to hear you thank you along that line i keep thinking about you repeatedly saying god is faithful. Mm -hmm. But you don't repeat, but you do and show is you are faithful to God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And that's an important side mm -hmm. of that coin. God is faithful. I am faithful to God. And that for me is about a guide for us. Remain faithful <clears throat> to him as he is faithful sure, to us. Sure. Okay. Even in choosing who's, who will follow you. Hmm. Yeah? yeah. And knowing that you're a part of that. I mean, that's, I, personally, I am um, excited about the fact that I believe that in as much as God brought you here 47 years ago and brought me here 15 years ago, that in fact, he was certainly God and now that I am tasting him, I'm going to give you some ideas. Okay. All right. I see Carmelita said, Pastor Stewart trusted God's Leadership. leadership, buying and building and paying off debt, showing us how to serve others by being a cheerful giver. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. I really didn't expect <laughs> the answers that you all gave. Uh, that was Pastor Stewart, this is Craig. Good, morning. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you taught me a lot since I've been coming to the church, even though I try to come as much as I can. But you taught me a lot about more studying the Bible more and, you know, trusting God, but studying the Bible, knowing what it means, and just taught me some things that I never thought, you know, uh, how you deep and you preach. And when you preach, it really hits my heart hard when you preach. And it just goes through me. So I know the Lord got you. The Lord got you forever, you know. And um, that's all I just wanted to know, to tell. All right, thank you very much. Real yes. quick, you said yes. that you didn't expect the answers that you received. What 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 were you expecting? I wasn't expecting. 
I wasn't ex expect expecting the focus to be on me. Wow. I just wasn't expecting that. That, mm. that that threw me off. So mm. let me go to question number four. What might we need, and this is very important in light of all that we just said, what white might we need to be cautious about reflecting over the last 47 years as we look to the unknown place where FIBC is headed? Again, what might we need to be cautious about reflecting over the last 47 years as we look to the unknown place where FIBC is headed? Yes, sir. So reflecting on an earlier question about trying to get into uh, Abraham's um, mindset about when he got, when God told him to go, I mean, I don't know if I just couldn't get there. I can't get there. I mean, you would have to, I mean, the drum kit would have to catch fire and start talking to me or something. And then you'd probably have to do two more before I would, you know, I'm like, that's God. That is God. Okay. I, I believe it now. And I, I would, that would be enough for me to have that faith that he's working and talking at me. And now I have to react to it. And I say that to say this. So part of transition is this excitement that you're talking about. God's been with us. God has worked with us. He has brought us through transition. There's an exciting new chapter out in front of us. If we allow him to, uh, if we listen to him and allow him to guide us and we're faithful to God to go where he leads. But transition is a time of, of um uncertainty and i know there's an adversary out there who would love to take advantage of some uncertainty yeah. to yeah. then make his way in somehow to someone yeah. to do something yeah. to get us off track to, yeah. to set some kind of snare or trip us up somehow a stumble it just that just sounds like what that thing does uh so that would be something uh we need to be aware of and, and pray over for sure. As the mic is getting passed around, um, a couple of people on the chat here um, says taking things for granted, complacency, lack of faith and doubt. Uh, those are, those are, those are good, good ones. Um, not good in the sense of we should do them, but good in the sense of the question. Sister Harrison says not being open-minded and not quick to say we do not, we did not do it that way. Mm -hmm. Be very prayerful in mm -hmm. decisions mm -hmm. and make, and we make, uh, be prayerful in the, in the decisions that we make and we're going to make. Um, then we have uh, Reverend Graves says, be cautious of expecting everything to remain the same. Abraham had to exact, expect change in a move. Yeah. FIBC should anticipate yeah. and be ready to receive yeah. some changes yeah. with an open heart that yeah. trusts God's plan. And then another one, not comparing whoever is in place to yeah. the leadership of the church to Pastor Stewart. So those are the great things. That Rod has. Yeah. We got this here and then we go to Rod. Okay. One, one second, Rod. Okay. Um, and in response to what you said, Pastor, I think well, we need to be uh, mindful of wolves in sheep clothing because of your legacy. Sure. You know, what you have set before us and, you know, everything that, everything that you built, you know, in this church and people know who you are and what you have done. So there's going to be uh, people clamoring for this position. And we just need to know, need to have the uh, spirit of, um, uh, of discernment and God doesn't give the spirit of confusion. Mm -hmm. So it's, it should be pretty simple if people keep talking about what you've done, how they learned from you and things like that. It doesn't have to be confusing, but we just have to be mindful and um, have the power of discernment. Good. Good. 
we'll go brother Rod and then we, you got something. Okay. Go ahead, Rod. Um, I think something else that we need to watch out for is um the future. Um like you passed the talent and anybody in your age bracket, uh the people that got nets. And uh and the reason why I'm saying that and I, and I'm not trying to be political or anything like that, but as the future unfolds with uh, our country and just the world as a whole, um, the way that I, I when I when I see you, Pastor Talley, and I see other young adults, and it feels strange because when I was your age, and it, it and I lived to get older, and uh, my prayer was to. Uh, uh, not to be a pessimist, just to outlive my father because he died when he was your age. And so the mere fact um, that I'm sitting here and I'm in my 50s and I thank God for it, he answered my prayers. But my thing is when I see y'all, uh, and excuse me for sounding country, uh, but I'm hoping that uh, somebody could speak to y'all as far as like the older generation about how to put, you know, savings and preparing for the future, um, uh, preparing for rainy days, you know, uh, getting ready for things because um, y'all got next, y'all got now, and y'all got the future, you know. So I just, I, I pray for y'all uh, that you would be able to make it through the transition of FIBC and what's going on in the world because a lot of people, they... Uh, well, young people, or, or regardless of the generation, sometimes they they don't have a godly focus, uh, and um, and so I'm just hoping that FIBC could prepare the next generation um, and get them ready. If there's a big mama, a big papa, a papa, a peepa, whatever you call them, that could just say, "Hey, listen, this is what you need to do and to get ready," uh, because they've um, well, Dr. Stewart, you've seen so much, and there are a lot of people still here that's left of uh, the older generation that have seen a lot and experienced a lot. So I'm just hoping that that's what we uh, uh, pay attention to, those the people that got next that will be here after we are long gone. All right. Was there anything in chat? All right. Thanks, Brother Rob, for that. And Sister Easter said, it, it to be so quick to... Uh, to make a decision about the next leader, be led by the Holy Spirit and not popularity, how a person sounds. Okay. All right. So I, I'm going to read verses five through nine, and I'm going to let Pastor Tally take these questions. Then we're going to get to the 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 real the challenging part about when Mo, when uh, Abraham messed up about his wife. Okay. So uh, so verse five, Abram took his wife Sarai. And his brother's son, Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Moray. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. He built, so he built an altar to the Lord who appeared, who had appeared to him. From there, he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and I on the, Ai on the east, and there built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. Verse 9. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. So let me just give, you, give you a little background, then Pastor Tyler will ask the question. In obedience and faith, Abram and his family, which included his nephew Lot and all those workers they had acquired in Haran, journeyed to Canaan with their possessions. The journey, their journey had stops along the way. At two of those stops, Verses 7 and 8 indicate Abram built an altar at Shechem and near Bethel. He called on the name of the Lord in both of those places. Then Abram and his family journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. All right. <clears throat> Question number one. 
What do you see in these verses that we should highlight? From Genesis 12, verses 5 through 9, what, are, what do you see in these verses that we should highlight? What are some observations you see? All right. so there was not a rush. <laughs> so obedience and faith, and then someone said it, was, it wasn't a rush? Is that what you said? Right. He didn't rush doing stuff. He took oh. his time because he did it in stages. Okay, so there was something. <laughs> Sila. There was somebody that's already said Sila. All right. Good, good. Any others? What do you see in these verses we should highlight? I see the altar building. Yeah. Yeah. Two, but two different stops. He he built an altar and invoked the presence of the, the name of the Lord. So that is very important. Uh, not only that he had stops, but that he built altars. There. One thing I see that he also journeyed on afterwards. Yeah, he kept going. Kept going. He kept going. He kept going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, come, 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 come. <laughs> people, <laughs> we want people online to hear. Uh, and that, and that. Is the big thing for FIBC. Keep going. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The mission Keep doesn't stop. Going. We, we pause to manage this transition of the leader, but the church mm. goes on. Yeah. It's good. Good. All right. Number two. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Deacon Durbin. What? You know, we do it weekly. We almost do it daily where, you know, so many of us, most of us, hopefully, you know, all of us in some way invoke the name of the Lord, right? We're deliberately connecting to him in, in prayer. Mm. What does it mean here, this deliberate, is it just on this day I'm going to invoke the name of the Lord and I feel led to put this altar? Or is there something kind of fundamentally different about this this invocation of the Lord on on those those days, I I, mean, I see it's important that along the journey, it's a very deliberate acknowledgement of of the God of God still being with him and working. And I'm like, oh, I got that today, and I'm gonna build sure. build an altar. Um, but is there something else different, or you know? I, it just the the word doesn't say like oh yeah every day Ab Abraham and the family got together for prayer and you know and then there's something different about these these days what what is different does that make sense what I'm asking yeah it makes sense um, I I don't know. In the commentaries I read and studied in prayer for his lesson, it did not give any significance. The significance was not where he stopped, but that he stopped at two different places, at two different places. and pray and built an altar and acknowledged. There, God. Uh, the first place was near Bethel, I believe, or the second place. Right, looking east and then yeah, towards yeah. the next. Hmm. But that's all right. I mean, it yeah. could be something in yeah. The one yeah. thing that the commentary said about Moray, it says, okay, if you look at verse six, Abraham passed through the land of place of Shechem to the oak of Moray. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, now, the, the word Moray means teaching. So I don't know if that's their significance. The, the, the word Moray, it, so the, the, it, it, some of the scholars believe it was a place where he learned something. Yeah. So he built an altar at Moray because Moray in Hebrew means teaching and Bethel means house of God. The next place he stopped was Bethel and Bethel in Hebrew means house of God. Now, again, I I, hmm. I don't. I feel you. Yeah. No, I feel you. And it gives me reason to go go back and see if so it's good. something in entomology, but I, I see that. Okay. Uh, Robert Harmon, um, uh, I want to take a station break right quick. Hey, <laughs> right, Robert. Uh, Pastor, uh, I was talking with, and I told him what we were going through with the Sela and stuff. And he was like, well, for what? He said, uh, 
Your pastor is going to pray to God and he's going to pick the person that's going to be your next uh, pastor. He said, that's the way we always do it. And, you know, and uh, but what he did do, because I appreciate what we are doing and you've always been inclusive with us. But I did start to think that, OK, now I know we waiting for God to enlighten us and give us revelations. But is that the whole reason why we're going through this process and. Because I'm kind of sitting here like Abraham. I'm like, I have no idea who the Lord is going to send us. Do you have any idea who the Lord might send our way past? Well, no. I think I think that's the part of the seat. We're, we're, we're see- Before we move to succession or anything like that, we're, we're, we're pausing. We're Selah. And so I think that's a very logical question to ask. But I think right now is important for us just to be on, on pause. That station break that you said. We got to pause there. Yeah, and I don't know if you hear the Sunday that that, that 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 I made my announcement, and I mentioned as they were passing out the 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 the, the, the CELA document that how it came as I was talking to a colleague of mine who has retired, and in the middle of our conversation, he said Warren, he said CELA, he said the word CELA just dropped in my spirit. He said, y'all don't need to jump to what's next. Y'all need to stop and reflect on what is done, God has done over the last 47 years. And then, and so, and so, and I said, then God is going to speak to us during this season. I believe that. So. All right. All right, number two. Why is it significant that Abram left nothing behind in Haram once he and his family departed to their new homeland? Why is it significant that Abram left nothing behind in Harman, Haran once he and his family departed to their when new homeland? I've moved a lot over the years. Okay. okay. And I can tell you that my most Thing that was important to me was to be comfortable where I was so that I wouldn't regret where I left. So can you say that say that again? To be comfortable in the new place mm. so I won't have any regrets about something that oh. was in the old place. Okay. So you take it all, you know, you take all those things with you that are your creature comforts. And then when you're in a new environment, you can sit back and say, okay, this is just like home. Because mm. it is home. Mm. That's good. Sister Nancy. Nancy, you take everything because you don't know what you might need. <laughs> that, that's a very practical answer. <laughs> that is where you, you don't know what you're going to need. That's right. That's why you might get there. Well, I should have brought such and such. You just and yeah, you and you discard it once you get there if you don't need it. Uh, Pastor Tally. Oh yeah, yeah, Sister Carmelita. Then we'll go Reverend Gray. Then Brother Ernie. I want to ask. I mean, the comment that Robert Harmon made. I think it's better to do it this way because if we knew up front who the pastor was going to be, I feel in my heart that we'll start judging. And taking a break and just doing it this way gives an op- us an opportunity to prepare our minds, heart, and soul on whoever it may be. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Carmelita. I got your name right this time, right? Yes, you did. Thank you. Reverend Graves. <laughs> and uh, Reverend Tyler, this is uh, Kathy Denton. Um, to me, it's very, very important. I came from a church where... Uh, my pastor had passed away and then they got in a real big hurry to, you know, get a new pastor and had not taken the time to grieve and to, uh, you know, take those feelings and things under consideration and go to the Lord seeking uh, guidance from him uh, whatever, because you can, you know, uh, the scripture says we have a tendency to be looking at, you know, how good you look, whether you can walk the pews, whether you can uh, holler and all of this. 
where you want someone who is going to teach you the word, who's going to put the gospel in the forefront and so forth. And it takes time to do that. Mm. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Graves, you still there? Yes, sir. I was uh, reflecting on the co the question about why did they take everything? And it made me think about later when we see Lot and his wife and God told them, don't look back. You know, God seems to tell you when you move forward, keep moving forward. There's no reason to look back. And if they would not have taken everything, there may have been regret or reason to think on what they had left behind. Leaving nothing says that their view could be on what's forward and what's the. Thank you. That's good. That's good. Brother Ernie. <clears throat> well, I, um, I like that thought about I sort of moved around a lot. <laughs> um, but I, oh, I moved from house to house. I took home, home is my heart, home is my family, home I take with me so that wherever I am, there is home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And that's very different from moving from house to house. Could you keep the mic up to you, Mom, so that I'm, we can hear you? <laughs> yeah. So. So the notion of moving from house to house or from land to land is different from, but I carry my home, mm -hmm. my heart, my family, and all of that with me. So I always feel oh. that I am home. Excellent. Thank you, Brother Ernie. That's good. By the way, for those in the chapel, just microphone etiquette. Uh, just ice cream cone. Just think like you're eating an ice cream cone. Just don't, just don't eat the microphone. So if you ever down and out, ice cream cone. That's that's where we're at with it. Okay. okay. Number three. In our age of traveling from one place to another, often nonstop, what is the value of making significant journeys and stages, especially for FIBC over the next nine months? I'm going to repeat that again. In, in our age of traveling from one place to another, another, often nonstop, what is the value of making significant journeys and stages, especially for FIBC over the next nine months? This person. Chaplain. There is a thing that people talk about, enjoy the journey. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are so anxious to get to the destination that they miss out on things along the way that will get them there. So by going slowing down, we might start thinking in terms of another direction we want to go in, other ministries that can be done. But if we just rush to it, we're on somebody else's agenda. Mm. It's good. It's good. All right. Well, I'll, oh, go ahead. Also, Pastor, Pastor Cal. Yes. Also, you have to understand too. Well, we got to understand, Brother Craig. Okay. <laughs> you came. Hello. Okay, you're back. We now you're back. You're back. <laughs> Okay, oh, we lost you, brother Craig. Uh, on the we lost you on the journey. Oh, I'm trying to stay on the path. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Stay on the path. Stay on the path, Craig. <laughs> I'm trying not to get off, but what I was saying is sometimes a change that we switch when things happen. You know, like when we move. Sometimes we uh, need to keep our journeys towards. Where are we going, regardless of what's going on? Because sometimes there might be a delay or a detour, you know, and we still have to stay our course. Like, I just got off the path, but I got back on. So we need to keep doing that. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, brother. The next question is just going to be a personal question that you can answer on your own. Um, so you do that on your own personally. 
turn it over back to you, Pastor. All right, and 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 it simply was share how you are praying um, during the season. It goes back to the 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 fact that Abram built these altars. He he took time to pray, and so just just I just ask you a personal question. You have to answer it. How are you praying during this? season so all right so i'm not going to read if you have your bibles i'm going to explain G genesis 12 10 to 20 it's it's very deep and we might go a little over because I, uh, uh, because I believe we can finish the lesson today so if you have to leave at one that's fine but we're going to look over all right an unexpected interruption occurred during abram's journey to where the lord sent him a famine in the land to survive the famine in canaan Abram took his family to neighboring Egypt in Africa. The part of Egypt where he went was fertile land near the Nile River. He and his family resided there as aliens. Abram's wife, listen to this, who was named Sarai at the time before her name was changed by the Lord also to Sarah, was obviously a beautiful woman. Before they entered Egypt, Abram conferred with his wife that her beauty might be attractive to the Egyptian men who would lust for her. In so doing, they might kill Abram and take her to be one of their wives. He directed Sarai to tell the inquiring Egyptians that she was his sister. She was his niece as the daughter of his brother, Harry. So she wasn't his sister. She was actually his niece. This was so his life would be spared by the Egyptians. We do not know if Sarah, this is very important for the men and the women, we do not know if Sarah had a choice in her husband's proposition. Even though he talked with her, we don't know if, it, if she could say, I know I don't want to do this. Because that was a patriarchal society, and, and, and usually what the men said went. All right. Once they entered Egypt, the Egyptians were struck by Sarai's extraordinary beauty. The Egyptian immigration officers reported to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, how attractive she was. Consequently, Sarah was taken from Abraham and transported to Pharaoh's house to become a member of his harem as one of his sex partners. That's what a harem was for, to have sex. Genesis 12 does not indicate, listen a minute, how long she was housed in the royal harem. However, by deduction from verse 16, I will read verse 16, and for her sake, Pharaoh dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys and camels. So, so the Pharaoh loaded up Abram once he turned his wife over to her. All right. So by deduction from verse 16, Sarai was there long enough for Abram to benefit abundantly from their prearranged deal to pose as his sister instead of his wife. Footnote from the New Interpretive Study Bible. Abraham, and, 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 and this is two opinions on what happened here. Abraham's speech poses two moral dilemmas that have troubled interpreters for centuries. He proposes lying to Pharaoh and is prepared to abandon his wife to save his own skin. Some interpreters have simply recognized Abraham's frailties and rebuked him for taking matters into his own hands instead of relying on God for help, as in fact he does in other situations, Genesis 12, 4, 15, 5, 20, 22, 7, and 8. Other interpreters, without necessarily condoning his behave, such behavior in any situation, are more sympathetic. Seeing in the couple's behavior a strategy for survival, in extreme circumstances. Abram and Sarai are aliens in Egypt, verse 10. A Hebrew term signifying a foreign resident who lacks kinship, ties, or property, 
and who thereby lacks legal status in society. Without rights, Abram and Sarai are vulnerable. Abram faces possible death, verse 12, and Sarai possible shame and abuse as a widowed foreigner. Their behavior may thus be understood as the kind of strategy demanded for survival of those who live in a society without full status, rights, and power. God intervenes. The Lord afflicts Pharaoh and his house with severe plagues because Sarai, Abram's wife, had become a member of his harem. Pharaoh frantically contacts his foreign resident about not being upfront about Sarai, not letting him know that she was his wife. He reminded Abram that he had told him that she was his sister, which led him to take her as one of his wives. Pharaoh replied, in essence, take this woman who is your wife and get out of Egypt now. Pharaoh gave orders that his immigration officers escort Abram, Sarai, and all their possessions out of his country. So before we get into the, the Abram and Sarai thing, verse 10 says, now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to reside there, for the famine was severe as an alien. What is the message for FIBC in verse 10? That there was a famine in the land and that Abram went down to Egypt as an alien. Is there a message? Is there a message for us about the famine, about going to Egypt? Yes, I think we need to be careful um, what Satan might throw in the game. And no, don't we act like Abraham did. We need to totally trust God in spite of what's going on. We need to totally trust him because we could get in a situation that is not very comfortable for some people. So we need to be very careful and is trust in the Lord. All right. Yes, sir. Is it possible that Abram was trusting in the Lord by the decision he made to go to Egypt, you think? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if there was a famine in Canaan, that means they probably would, they're, 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 they're more likely they would have died. And so he knew the Lord sent him there. That was, that, that was the place where to go. But right that, at that time, the conditions were not conducive for him to stay there. So, yeah, I, I would think he, he trusted the Lord to go down to Egypt. But once he got there, he didn't trust the Lord <laughs> about his wife. It's an illustration, this whole journey, right? God told me to do it. I'm going to do it. I acknowledge God. God is with me. But then there are times where it's like he seems to feel confident in coming up with his own strategies and making some of his own decisions. Right. That's a big detour. And this whole thing with his wife, that's a convoluted strategy, right? But uh, it isn't as obvious that God was telling him to do those things as it was in some of the other cases. So there's this mixture of God led and then God just allowing perhaps Abraham to come up with some strategies okay. that don't seem to work out. I mean, I don't know, but I, I see the mix in there. Hmm. Yeah. My thought is, is the end result was Pharaoh told him to get out, but he gave him things to go with. It was like they got presents. <laughs> so that ultimately... Yeah, but think, what, look at the cost. But it was, <laughs> well, it didn't ever... It, it said she was in the harem. It didn't say she got... <laughs> 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 
listen, now you know a brother went <laughs> on him all of that and he wasn't getting nothing in, in return. Now you know that. that I, anyway, unless he was just going to look at her. <laughs> Thank you, Deacon okay. Durbin. Captain. We got Sister Joe says, gotta, uh, gotta keep the faith and trust God. Oftentimes, change transition is not easy. And I think I uh, hear Sister Birdie. Yes. We, and Reverend, we, Sister, one of Sister our Birdie favorite. Or Reverend Graves. Who goes first, me or her? You can go first. You can go first. Okay. One of our favorite scriptures, all of us, is trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not thine own understanding. But all of us, including Abraham, lean to our own understanding. Yes. He used his human knowledge, and we do too. We have to always stop and examine us, ourselves when we think we know exactly what we should yes. do. And the older we are, the more experienced we are, we know from the last time we keep learning sometimes the wrong thing. So we really have to, you know, just as I, you heard me say many times, let a man examine himself, examine our, our motives and the things we do and why we do it and see if it follows God's prescriptions for us. We just have to stop sometime and think. But he used his own human understanding, which was very yep. uh, wise for, for human wisdom. Aisha. Amen. Um, Amen. Um, you guys have said a lot, and now I'm lost in which comment I want to <laughs> respond to because Pastor Stewart, I don't know. He may have given all those wonderful gifts, and she may have still been kept. And it, it makes me think about later we see this happen again. And the Lord spoke to that king in a dream and said, I've kept you from touching her and sinning against me. And so we we saw God preserve her later. I want to hope that God did the same thing. Her. OK, OK. And and, and and we don't know. And we don't. But, know. I, but what I want to speak to is maybe I'm moving this slower than you intended to. You had asked about the famine. And so I was thinking specifically about um, a famine and how that correlates with the transition. And I was thinking about during a famine, it feels like a dry desert place. Mm -hmm. And anytime you're in a waiting season, it, it with a it's something unknown. It could feel like a dry desert place. And so I was just thinking about them in a season of famine and in a season of a wait and a transition, how those kind of correlate. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, Sister Birdie answered question two by, and, and it is, what are some scriptural options to manage in a situation like the dilemma facing Abram and Sarai, who were about to enter a potentially dangerous situation? And she she, she quoted Proverbs, what is it, three, five, and six, and and there are others. So I want to go to lesson three because it tie it ties it in with our transition. What lessons can we learn about the way Abram managed the situation relative to his wife becoming a member of Pharaoh's harem, especially related to our senior pastoral leadership transition? What, what lessons can we learn? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Take the mic. What lessons can we learn about how he managed it relating to us? I would say that... Um to rely on him in every part of it. Not like he said, we'll rely on him up to a certain part. And then he decided to do it on his own. As far as the church concerned, trust that God is going to make sure that whoever is supposed to come will be appointed and um, not to oppose that or try to figure it out or do it on your own. Someone else. What can we learn from how and really, Abram, according to our understanding, mismanaged the thing with his wife because she went into Pharaoh's harem and he lied. Well, he lied. First, he lied. So, so that was the first thing. And then, then she went into the harem. So she was separated from him. So what is there any, what else can we learn from, from how he mismanaged that situation? 
for Pastor, um, what would I maybe might be a weird question, but why he didn't tell the truth if he had to tell the truth that that she was his uh, sister instead of wife? Would that matter? If say he had you, to tell the truth, say what you said. Say what you said. Ask again. Would that? Would that? Uh, I don't understand what you said. I was saying, uh, would that make a difference if he had to tell the truth about his wife being his sister instead of his wife to Pharaoh? Well, he might, he might have lost his head. I oh. mean, I mean, that was his concern that Pharaoh was going to kill him and still get the wife. So I guess, well, so he he saved his life. His wife was in the harem. God inter and that's a, that God intervened because if God had not intervened, he he may not have gotten his wife back. And he would have gotten all those possessions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, somebody says Psalm 37 3 says, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and and befriend faithfulness. All right. So, so um, thank you for saying, you know, not get ahead of ourselves and let's do what God says. The last question: why did God intervene when he did? in compromising the situation that at least Abraham's actions had created. Why do you, so, so God came in to the rescue. Why do you think God came in when he did? Because he already had a covenant promise to Abram when he became Abraham. That was the reason why he intervened. Because even with Sarah in the harem, she still could have come pregnant. And that was not in the agenda. Right. That's, that's certainly that time. true. That's certainly but I true. noticed she didn't put up a big fight. Oh well, yeah, she that but understand a woman woman's status in that thing was just was almost like a piece of property. Mm -hmm. So I d I don't know that she had much choice. In that, it was two men fighting over a woman. Well, yeah, it wasn't really a fight. It, it, it was one man who had power who took what he wanted, and the other, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're going Pastor to. Stuart, I have a question. Oh yeah, yes, you have a question, Carmelita. Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes. So now, wasn't she? She she was married already to Abraham, right? Yes. Yes. So I feel like God intervened because he, this oh, Pharaoh, whoever he was, he was going to take her as his wife. So he knew that she was already married. So he probably didn't want her to commit adultery with okay. her not knowing. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next week, we're going to deal, we're going to study about Joseph. Joseph was another transitional leader. And from chapter 50 of Genesis. So if you want to read up and have your question and have your own questions or your own comments about Joseph uh, in chapter 20, I want you to be sure to do that. Hey, I'm chapter 50, not chapter, chapter 20. All right, as we get ready to close in prayer, uh, Sister Ned Smith Willis is still in Banner Desert Medical Center. Uh, Pastor David L. Wade of Mount Carver Baptist Church has a recurrence of cancer. We have lost uh, another member since um, uh, Sunday, since this weekend. Uh, again, we want to remember the family of Elder Julius C. Staten, who died on Friday. His homegoing service will be Saturday at 11 o'clock, viewing at 10 a.m. here at FIBC. Um, and uh, remember Sister Concy Payne, who joined many, many years ago from Kansas City, Missouri. I, I knew her home church back there, and she came to, uh, uh, with her husband. He died but a few years ago. Well, she died unexpected, unexpectedly on Saturday. Her daughter found her, and so, uh, uh, but her mother left. She wanted no funeral, so she's going to be buried back in um, uh Kansas City, Missouri, but she was, uh, in, she is in our system, and she was active. She, she hadn't come back since COVID because her daughter said she was afraid of 
uh, for health reasons. But she, she's in our system, and I knew her very well. She, she would come on special days, and so I want to remember the family of Concy Payne, her daughter Rhonda. Sheila Jordan Griffin, the oldest daughter, or the second oldest daughter, I believe, of the Jordan family, lost her son unexpectedly in his 40s to a massive heart attack. And Margaret uh, Jordan Washington called me from uh, Pennsylvania today to let me know that. Are there any other prayer requests? Uh, Pef yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Sister Deborah Long lost her yes. cousin, right. uh, Teresa Fowler, last night. Okay, Sister Deborah Long lost her cousin. That's right. Thank you for letting me know that. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. God, we thank you today for our Bible study about Abram being a transitional leader in the Bible. Um, uh, we've learned about how he was a man of faith. Uh, we learned about how you uh, took him from one place to another, how he built altars at different stages of his journey, how he left, he took all his possessions, left nothing behind to follow you. And we also learn how he was a frail human being like each one of us. And in a crisis, first there was the, the famine crisis, and then there was a crisis of integrity. And um, he didn't do so well on the crisis of integrity. But you, hallelujah, you do what you do. <laughs> you, when we don't do what we're supposed to do, you often do what you do and step in and intervene and save us out of a mess. And God, you did that. God, may these lessons be not only helpful to us in transition as a pastor and people, but in, in as people in the transitions we go through in our lives. God, we lift up Sister Annette Smith-Willis. We lift up Pastor Wade. We lift up the Staten family. We lift up the Payne family. We lift up the Long family. We lift up the Jordan family and all those who bereave. God, we lift up our brothers and sisters in the Middle East. Uh, Israel is just, just bombing, killing people after people after people. And we as a nation and our president has stood by and really done nothing other than arm them. God, help us in that situation. Help us in that situation and all situations surrounding us. God, we love you. We praise you. Help us through this, Selah. We are now in, I think, the second and a half week, and we're moving forward. Thank you so much. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.